Hello, everyone. Welcome to After Owners Club. Um, a couple of people have been asking why I'm doing videos once in a while about things um, outside of Aptera. And, you know, I do things about battery tech and solar and things like that that are not that are somewhat peripherally related to Aptera. But I've been doing some micro mobility things about like Nimbus and e-bikes and uh, U EUCs and things like that. And I think it's because like many of you, I'm an efficiency nut and e-bikes e and bicycles are just the most efficient way to uh, move something around, move people around. And so I've been doing some videos on e-bike reviews, talking about why bicycling is safer. And, and really, e-bikes are doing more than electric cars for decrease in um, oil consumption and carbon re uh, reduction globally. Because and the Aptera is extremely efficient at using about 100 watt hours per mile. And um, that's the projected efficiency of Aptera, which is about three times more efficient than um, a Model 3 or other comparable electric car. And that's one of the reasons that we love it. And that's mainly the reason that I love it, because I feel like cars are a necessary evil, in, especially in the United States, where public transit infrastructure is pretty bad. And so you do need a, a, a car, especially when you want to go far distances. But for most other trips, I think a bicycle is great. And in comparison, let's say an Aptera gets 100 watt hours per mile. This bike gets 10, uses 10 watt hours per mile. So it's 10 times more efficient than the Aptera, which is already a very, very efficient uh, vehicle. So you can see um, how that works. Now, I've always ridden my bike to work because I feel like it has multiple uh, health benefits and environmental benefits and financial benefits and that's true not only on a personal scale but on a like global scale and um, that's why i've been kind of talking about it because one of the most inefficient things is like you know when when i'm doing like a home improvement project or fixing a faucet or something i go to lowe's or home depot or something and i find, i get the part and i come home and i realize the part doesn't quite fit and then I have to drive back there to get like a washer that weighs one ounce. So I have to drive this like 3000 pound vehicle to go get a one ounce part, which makes absolutely no sense. So I, I hated doing that. So I would ride my bike. But of course, riding my bike, Lowe's and Home Depot is about like six, seven miles from my house uh, to go there and back. It would take me about an hour um, and it was a little annoying, but with an e-bike, I can get there and back in like less than 30 minutes. And it's a lot of fun. And using an e-bike to go pick up, you know, the eggs that you need from the grocery store or just doing the small um, errands, it it just is has a lot of uh, benefits for everyone involved. So the thing that people don't realize is that cars cost society and the world uh, both financially and in terms of uh, people's health and um, in terms of environmental costs. Uh, cars are kind of one of the most inefficient ways of moving uh, people around because, again, most cars have one occupant um, and one occupant in a three to four thousand pound vehicle is just not um, an efficient way to go. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the costs of being so car dependent. So there are lots of costs to uh, driving. Okay, so there's the obvious costs. The obvious costs are the cost of keeping up the roads and the cost of fueling the vehicle, maintaining the vehicle, and owning the vehicle, and the, insuring the vehicle. Those are all costs that we think about instinctively, but there's a lot of costs that we don't really think about. And that is the cost of vehicle crashes. Um, so vehicle crashes, 40,000 Americans are killed in vehicle crashes. And of course, with the American obsession with bigger and bigger vehicles, there's kind of an arms race to bigger vehicles. And bigger vehicles um, have more kinetic energy, release more energy, and are more dangerous in accidents. So the bigger the vehicle is, the more dangerous you are to everyone else. So if everyone drove smaller vehicles, we'd be less dangerous to everyone else. But because everyone wants to protect themselves and are self-interested, we want a bigger vehicle to protect ourselves, but it's at the cost of damaging those around us. Um, and the 
we, we almost 40,000 Americans are killed in vehicle crashes. There's a lot of financial damage. And that's not putting into cost the, uh, these are just people that die in car accidents. There's a lot of people that are seriously injured in car accidents and that doesn't you know quite capture that. And so if you look at injuries, property damage, they totaled half a trillion dollars in a year. Uh, and then there are quality of life valuations. If you count in like injuries and things like that, that's over a trillion dollars. Okay, so that's that's a thing that people don't think about too often as a cost of um, uh, the vehicle culture that we live in. Then there's air pollution. So air pollution um, is the single largest contributor to premature deaths from air pollution. And we suspect there's about 60,000 deaths each year prematurely um, due to air pollution. And then there's climate change. I know this is somewhat of a political topic, although I don't think it should be a political topic, but it has become one. Um, but this is also, if you if you think of a cost for this, um, there is some small additional cost to uh, the cost of climate change mitigation and things like that. And then there's noise pollution. Uh, and noise pollution has a lot of health effects, especially psycho psychological health effects. But um, damn, you know, our brain and our body are very uh, linked together, and that can cause um, increased risk for cardiometabolic diseases like diabetes and things like that cardiovascular diseases, strokes, that kind of stuff, and obviously the psychiatric um, issues with uh, noise pollution as well. Okay, so that um, is some of the hidden costs that we don't think about. There's another study that was published out of April 2021, and I'll link these studies in the um, description below. This one was a European study looking at the total costs of, um, of ownership, and they basically, they looked at um, the, the cost of travel, like if, if this is a um, study out of Germany, and the typical German car travels about 15,000 kilometers per year. That's significantly less than the driving that an American car uh, drives. And they figured out that the total lifetime cost of car ownership, um, so if you owned a car for 50 years, and that's not the same car, but if you own the same type of car for 50 years, it would range between $600,000 um, $600, for Opel Corsa. I had no idea what an Opel Corsa was, so I looked it up. This is what an Opel Corsa is. It's basically a small economy car um, to a million uh, euros for a Mercedes GLC. So that's, uh, you know, a higher end car. And the share of this cost borne by society is about 41% to 29%. So between 40 and 30%, depending on the vehicle. Um, the cost of society is a little bit higher as a percentage, not as an absolute value. So absolute value is still higher for the bigger car, uh, about um, 5,000 pounds per year versus uh, 4,600 pounds per year for the Opel Corsa. And so if you extrapolate that to the United States, um, how many cars does the United States have? So in 2021, there were about 280 million vehicles in the United States. So if you extrapolate that, so about $5,000, I'm going to do the calculation, 5,000 times 280 million, uh, that is $1.4 trillion per year. Uh, that's if people drove like in Germany. Now, we know in America, we drive a lot more than people do in Germany. So the cost in America being $1.4 trillion a year is probably significantly less than um, uh the, I mean, the cost in America is significantly more than $1.4 trillion. That $1.4 trillion is probably a very low estimate. All right, here's another one. Um, this is looking just at um, air pollution costs, uh, looking at data from 2008 to 2016. And what they found is that the total societal costs per year was approximately $1.84 billion. And the range, depending on their errors within their estimation, ranged from anywhere from uh, 78 billion to 280 billion. And this is just for um, the uh, air pollution costs. And how do they come up with this dollar? It's, it's kind of another interesting tangent. Um, so they looked at this and they looked at what the statistical value of a human life was. And it's valued at around $9,217 U.S. dollars. So uh, adjusted to $217, inflation adjusted is $9 million. And so how do they figure out the value of a human life? Seems kind of an asinine uh, thing to try to ascertain. But this is something that government agencies do and a lot of companies do. And, how, and I heard about this first several years ago on this podcast called All Things Considered. Um, 
and it's how government agencies determine the dollar value of a human life. It's kind of interesting how they figured it out. In this, um, at this time, they said it's about ten million dollars. And there's a there's an economist uh, based out of Vanderbilt University. His name is Kit Viscusi, and he's the guy who figured out the methodology. Um, but don't blame him for it. I mean, he's he's just an economist. And the way he did it was kind of clever. What he did is he looked at data for all kinds of jobs. And, how, and jobs that required extra wages to, uh, to account for the increased risk of death. So he looked at a bunch of workers that are sort of at higher risk of job-related fatalities. And these are, you know, construction workers, nurses, coal miners, lawyers. Okay, I'm not sure why the lawyers are in there. But anyways, they looked like nurses, like pre-coronavirus numbers, and they asked them, how much more did you have to pay nurses to get uh, uh, a more dangerous job, like working in the ICU with coronavirus patients, or how much did you have to pay coal miners to work the more dangerous jobs than they would have otherwise? And if you look at that and you average out all the data, um, you can kind of figure out how much people are valuing their own lives. So if you say that if you pay me an extra $400 a year, and my chance of dying by taking that job increases by one in 25,000, then you've essentially put a value on your own life. And if you do all the data across the United States and see how much people are willing to work a more dangerous job for, you kind of come out with this number that's about $10 million. So people are sort of valuing their own lives by seeing how much money they'll take for a more dangerous job at about $10 million. So that's how they come up with these numbers, which I think is kind of fascinating, actually. There is another paper that was done by Harvard's uh, Business School. And um, we can just read the executive summary of it. And what this is, they looked at uh, the mass, just, they were just looking at Massachusetts. So Massachusetts has 37,000 miles of public roads and, and then also has adjacent parking spaces, 4.5 million private passenger vehicles and light trucks. Um, and then they found that the total annual cost of the vehicle economy is approximately $64 billion. So kind of compare that to the cost of creating the high-speed rail system in California was $128 billion, which is a lot. That's a lot. Um, but at the, this is every year you're paying $64 billion in Massachusetts. Um, that's not the cost to like build out the roads. I mean, that costs way more. This is just to maintain the, just maintain the system. And if you look at it, the public costs are 55% and the consumer costs are 45%. So let's look at the pie graph of how they figured this out. Okay, so consumer vehicle owning. So the consumer, the owner of the vehicle is paying about $27 billion. Okay, the, all the owners. This is like car payments, insurance payments, um, you know, via, uh, gas, fueling costs, maintenance costs, all that stuff. That's $27 billion. Then they say that the cost of residential parking is $1 billion. And they, they take that to mean um, that's not how much you're paying yourself to park your car in your driveway. But the value of that land, the driveway and the garage and the value, the cost you're paying to build that garage and driveway and carport and all that stuff and maintain that, across Massachusetts is about a billion dollars. Then greenhouse gases, so this is the thing, like if you don't believe in climate change, you can just cut that out, 1.2 billion. Um, so that doesn't, uh, that's not a huge portion of this. Uh, pollution, 1.1 billion, and that is, that is probably a gross underestimation, honestly. Then uh, consumer parking subsidy, congestion, injuries and death, parking land value, road land value, state operating, maintenance, back, you know, all this stuff. Um, and then if you add all that up, $64 billion for 4.5 vehicles. If you divide this by 4.5, you get about 14,000. And if you multiply 14,000 by the United States, 280 million, then you get about $4 trillion a year. So the cost to America is about $4 trillion a year. And about a little more than half of that will be borne by society, by non-owners of the car. So everyone is paying into it. Um, not just the uh, people that uh, own the cars. So you can never own a car, be a non-car owner, and you're still paying um, about two, you're paying half of the $4 trillion a year. And this cost is probably a little bit higher because Massachusetts is a very small state and they don't have that many roads and lots of the country is a lot more spread out and the roads are more spread out and there, it's a lot more land 
you so um, this may this may be a low estimate of the costs. Uh, this another way of looking at it. Someone else looked at uh, if you look at it this way. This is direct cost. This is how much a consumer pays. This is per year, ten thousand dollars per car, uh, and then indirect cost. This is like road costs not covered by road tax, free parking policing, sprawl, lost quality of life cost, that's $7 million. They're not taking into account like the value of the land or the road and that kind of stuff. That's why it's, this one looks like the societal costs are less than the personal costs. But even if you look at this, that's $20,000 per vehicle. That's a higher estimate than the $14,000 per vehicle that the Massachusetts study had. And if you use this, you're pu probably pushing closer to four and a half trillion dollars a year. So the uh, the United States is probably spending, you know, somewhere between four to five trillion dollars a year uh, to maintain its car culture. So if you look at that, then these public transit, uh, these public transit costs seem a lot more reasonable uh, when you when you kind of factor in all these things that um, can be largely mitigated by um, public transit things. And then if you look at these costs, you know, what are the things that the Aptera would do better? Um, so I think that vehicular crashes, Aptera is a very light car. It's less dangerous to other vehicles. Um, so it is gonna be cost less mortality in crashes and less damage in crashes. Like uh, the Hummer EV is gonna just be way more dangerous to everyone else. Uh, on the road than an Aptera is going to be. And air pollution, obviously way far, far less in an Aptera. You know, during operation, you know, very little, it, depending on where you're getting your charging from, if you're getting all from solar, like during operation, zero air pollution. If you're getting it from a fairly clean grid, a very little air pollution. And even if you're getting from like a coal powered uh, grid, it's very energy efficient. It's probably way less than way less air pollution than a, a, a internal combustion vehicle is being. Climate change, obviously much better. Noise pollution, this one is probably, I would say, pretty similar to another vehicle. I mean, it's lighter, so lighter vehicle is going to have less road noise in general um, because it has less tire noise. Uh, because it's aerodynamic, it's going to have far less wind noise, so in that case, it's going to be much better. Um, the engine noise, usually at high speeds, is pretty a small factor in the noise pollution. Probably most of the noise of cars at highway speeds is road noise with the tire and then um, wind noise. And so Aptera probably has like half the wind noise. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to mitigate a lot of these costs. Of course, um, I stand by the best form of transportation is going to be walking or cycling. Second best is probably going to be um, public transit transportation and then it but if you have to have a vehicle and in america it's very hard to function without a private vehicle aptera is going to be by far and away uh the best um, in terms of cost to both yourself and to society all right so hopefully that was an interesting uh discussion for you guys um, i think we just we just neglect to think about the cost of the status quo when we look at these public infrastructure projects we have to understand that the status quo is not cheap and it's not free. Um, and uh, we have to kind of analyze um, these things based on the idea that the status quo, our car culture is quite expensive, between four and five trillion dollars a year um, in the United States. All right, thanks for watching guys. And have a great day.